Don't know if you've noticed, but I happen to be a fan of Red Letter Media. I don't watch every half in the bag, but I do watch every ketchup video they put out. I like that format. Short form blurbs about the various films they watched, but never covered in a separate video, because other films have grabbed their attention. That's what this video is. I'm trying to catch up on some games that came out in 2022 and 2023. I'm not giving these games the same detail I would other subjects, because one of them is a surprise hit that has been likely well covered. One of them is a follow-up to a remake, back when remakes were still a novelty. And the last one is a short title, whose playtime spans about 30 minutes, but I think it's got some interesting ideas surrounding it. Let's start with the surprise hit. I'm here, baby. Who are you talking to? Huh? Hi-Fi Rush is a 2022 rhythm-based character action game by Tango Gameworks. You play as Chai, a guy with dreams of stardom who gets a robotic arm after applying for the Armstrong program at the local mega corporation. Something goes wrong with this procedure and he winds up having his music player hardwired into his heart. Using the magnetic properties of his arm, he can turn what was meant to be a tool for picking up trash into a weapon shaped like a flying V guitar out of scrap metal. In order to break out of the megacorp's facility, Chai has to work with the Underground Resistance to stop the launch of the company's next big release. Hey, everyone. Vibe check. I'm not really a rhythm games guy, and I wasn't sure if I would take to Hi-Fi's gimmick. But the game provides a lot of support to ease players so they can feel the rhythm and acclimate at their own pace. On normal, you always have the option of toggling the rhythm meter to see the beat and time your inputs, but you don't need to rely on it. It's like having training wheels you can choose to take on or off. Everything in the game world moves to the same beat, the hero, the rhythms, the environment. This one simple rule makes the concept so much simpler to understand once you learn how to apply it. Chai moves to the beat, which means he attacks to the beat, so you have to time your inputs to the beat to get the most return on your combos. Chai has a light and heavy attack. Since his movements are synced with the beat, light attacks only take one beat to perform, while heavy attacks take two beats to perform. Because enemies also move to the beat, you can time your dodges and parries to the beat to mitigate damage. And since background elements also move to the beat, you can use them as a metronome to figure out when the beat is actually happening. That's already a good foundation for the game, but what I like about Hi-Fi Rush is that it knows when to take inspiration from other character action games and add its own spin to the concept. Case in point, at the end of certain combos, Chai can perform a beat hit, which deals additional damage so long as he lands a last attack input on the beat. In a sense, Chai has wicked weaves. He also has a parry that can block in all directions, but you can get additional bonuses in combat if you add a directional input to your block. He even has pause combos, which are called rest combos in Hi-Fi, because when you wait a beat after attacking, you rest your combo before following up. Chai can call in his friends to provide support. They can help Chai with platforming challenges by clearing obstacles for him, or attack enemies that have special properties. Besides that, Chai can call in his friends to perform a beat hit to extend his combos. It's kind of like how SAS works in Scarlet Nexus. One of the collectibles you can pick up are gears, which serve as currency and allow you to buy upgrades. The way they're rendered as flat 2D sprites with heavily inked outlines reminds me of the pickups in Beautiful Joe. There are busts of the main villain scattered about the game, and they'll drop gears if you hit them. These busts have a durability meter and will break once you've broken that meter. The obvious inspiration are the red orb clusters you can break in the Devil May Cry series, but destroying a stone face made me think of the Easter Island statues that would pop out of the ground occasionally in God Hand. Speaking of God Hand, although Shinji Mikami only had an EP role on this game, I love how once Hi-Fi became a surprise hit in late 2022, Mikami would post pictures of the staff who worked in the game, like he's a proud parent showing off photos of his kids from his wallet. The cel shaded art style and character animations do a lot to carry the game's appeal. Tango is going for a very specific look, a Saturday morning cartoon from the early 2000s heavily inspired by anime, and they nailed it effortlessly. Hey! Alright kid, robotic arm, LX-275, magnetic waste management fixture. Wait, magnetic waste management? Foreign object morning. Looks like a defect. Take him in! 
Is that a weapon? Uh, I don't think so. I think he's resisting. Wait, what? The writing complements the art, and Hi-Fi manages to do what Sunset Overdrive couldn't. Make self-aware jokes and pop culture references funny. Doesn't look like you can make this jump. But see that switch? Let me guess. Yep, call me in. I can activate those for you. Ugh, you sound like a video game tutorial. Now you have to equip those M's. How? I mean, if this were a video game, I could just go to a menu. Pay attention, player! Uh, why am I hearing disembodied voices? Because you need to learn some and studies have shown this is the best way. Also, the game is a well-rounded cast of bosses and supporting characters. Chai comes off as clueless and self-absorbed at first, but his character arc feels natural and ends in a really satisfying moment. So Peppermint, this Spectrum thingy? What's that about? Spectra! Our informant sent me code implying it's an AI, apparently hidden in all Vandalay's Project Armstrong robotic parts. And what makes you so worried? My source said that Vandalay never kept a project under wraps like that before. There's red flags all over this. What? You have me running around on some dark web hunch? I trust my sources. You're sounding even more suspicious than Vandalay. Ugh, Chai, just... You know what? Don't care. I'm out of here after this anyway. Many moments later. Uh, are we sure we're gonna be okay? I have learned much from Mr. Chai. And you, sir, must chill out. Chai? Yeah? Chai, I do trust you. You know that, right? <laughs> Couldn't have done it on my own. The other really good thing this game does is provide an alternate soundtrack in case you plan on streaming the game so you don't get dinged by YouTube for using licensed music without permission. The only other game I know that does that is a Guardians of the Galaxy game, but that one was stupid about it because it would slap a watermark on your gameplay, indicating that you were streaming. I don't think I'll be S-ranking a fight anytime soon, but I had fun going through Hi-Fi Rush I know I can spend months on the game improving my performance, which is exactly what you're looking for in a character action game. Play Hi-Fi Rush. It's a banger full of banger moments and banger tracks. You got a killer track. But every song's gotta end. Let's move on from a breakout hit to a follow-up that went unnoticed. I'm ready! I'm ready! I'm ready! I forgot something! I forgot something! Many moments later... Your past has a way of sneaking up on you. You'll hear broken echoes of it everywhere, like a bad replay. You get mad at everybody for reminding you about it, even if it's all in your head. SpongeBob SquarePants The Cosmic Shake is a 2023 collectathon platformer by Purple Lamp. They developed Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated three years ago, and this is their first foray into making a SpongeBob game without an already established blueprint. This game is a puzzle to me. Wait a minute, that card. If I had to describe it as a mix of two other properties like a hack, I'd say it's like part Majora's Mask and part Family Guy back to the multiverse which is kind of appropriate considering the devs behind the original Bikini Bottom also made the Family Guy game. The Family Guy comparisons come from the multiverse conceit. Spongebob and Patrick use a magic item and screw up the fabric of reality, so they have to jump to different worlds to bring back their friends and restore Bikini Bottom to its former glory. The Majora's Mask comparisons come from the fact that Purple Lamp recycled several assets from Bikini Bottom rehydrated for Cosmic Shake. The ubiquitous Tiki heads are back, as well as a few other bits and bobs. But what's really confusing is the decision to reuse the same worlds as Bikini Bottom, but themed around bog standard genres for mascot platformers. Jellyfish Fields is now a western. Downtown Bikini Bottom is now the set of a karate film. Gulagoon Lagoon is swarming with pirates. Rock Bottom is now Halloween Town. Family Guy sort of did this. Each level was themed around a joke concept, and you see characters return from previous levels, but they're technically different now because it's the multiverse. Not a bad idea, 
but it doesn't do much for me because the gameplay isn't as interesting as Bikini Bottom. This is because, despite using Bikini Bottom as a foundation for the hub level and the individual worlds connected to it, Cosmic Shake doesn't have the same open-ended gameplay as Bikini Bottom. Bikini Bottom's structure was simple and direct. Collect gold spatulas to unlock each world, and collect more gold spatulas in those worlds to progress further into the hub, which had more worlds to unlock. At the end of each sub-area in the hub, you fight a boss and beating them unlock the next sub-area in the hub. What made Bikini Bottom interesting is that you didn't need to go through every world to beat the game. Watch a Bikini Bottom speedrun, and you can see how to optimize a playthrough by getting the minimum number of spatulas required to beat the game. It's good to have a game with that kind of flexibility, because it caters to players who like to optimize their runs, as well as players who are diehard completionists. Cosmic Shake does not have this structure. Instead, your goal for the entire game is to rescue your friends. You can't reach them until you play out an entire level, and the level design is very restrictive when it comes to pacing. Bikini Bottom's levels weren't as open-ended as Mario Odyssey's, but they were open enough to give you options on which spatulas you want to pursue. You know that no matter what you're doing at any given point in the game, there's always going to be a gold spatula at the end to reward you for your effort. But in Cosmic Shake, you don't get a reward for doing those activities. Your reward is the game allowing you to press on in the level. Consequently, everything you do in Cosmic Shake feels like a chore. Collect cactus sap to progress. Collect socks to progress. Collect candy bars to progress. Collect jellyfish to progress. Collect different colored keys to progress. You're doing the same thing in Cosmic Shake as you would in Bikini Bottom collecting stuff, but now you're doing more of it per level, and the things you collect only apply to the worlds in which they're found, so it's not as interesting as the golden spatulas in Bikini Bottom. In a way, Cosmic Shake proved that collecting tokens offers little to no value in games when they happen to be non-fungible. The weird thing is that gold spatulas are back in Cosmic Shake, but they're non-essential collectibles for an achievement. Also, when you beat each level, a random character from the show will ask you to go back and collect a new thing in the level you just beat to get another non-essential collectible. Also, the game is really heavy-handed with tutorials. Bikini Bottom has signs posted all over SpongeBob's house to teach you about his basic abilities, as well as test them out in optional areas. If you've already played the game, then you have the option of bypassing those areas. Cosmic Shake will stop everything to tell you how to perform all of SpongeBob's actions the first time you have to use any of them. The devs revamp SpongeBob's moveset by giving him Sandy's and Patrick's moves from Bikini Bottom. Spongebob can blow bubbles to hit floating switches, much like how Patrick could hug watermelons. He also has two levels of ground pound now, but we'll talk about that later. The more interesting change is that Spongebob now has all of Sandy's movement. He can glide with a pizza box by holding A, but he can only do so for a limited time. He can grapple onto fish hooks by holding right trigger. He also has a dodge roll now that has iframes, so this joke intro I made for Bikini Bottom became a prediction. You can also do a jump kick that homes in on targets. Sometimes the level design gets clever and takes advantage of this new skill by placing enemies near the edges of platforms so that Spongebob can zip across gaps towards him. The best parts of the game are when it mixes up platforming challenges by chaining all the new movement skills together. But like the level design, Cosmic Shake's combat is also more restrictive than Bikini Bottoms because the game will actually close off arenas It won't open up until you defeat all the enemies like a character action game. That's not bad in the early game, as basic enemies go down after one hit, but later enemy types are super chuffy for no reason. There are monster spawners that can do a stun attack that will leave you open for follow-up hits from ads if you don't time your dodge roll just right. They take three hits to beat, and you can't chain those hits back to back. You have to wait a few moments before they can take damage again. Then there are the worms that erupt from the ground to attack. You gotta stun them with a super ground pound, and then hit them to deal damage. Again, you gotta do this three times to beat them. But the worst of the bunch are the buff boys. They swing a bathtub at you, and you can only hit them when they're struggling to pick up the tub. But if they make contact with you at all, that resets their stun. And they have three different attack animations with no discernible pattern, and one of them has a lingering hitbox, so if you're too hasty, you'll eat the hit and your stun resets, and you gotta wait for the next opportunity. Every design decision feels like one step forward and two steps back. SpongeBob can glide now. Cool! but his jumps are really shallow and always feels like he shorts gaps you could have cleared in Bikini Bottom. Spongebob has two levels of ground pound to hit heavy switches, but it still only deals one pip of damage on enemies, so you can't rush down the beefier enemies who have three pips of health. Spongebob gets unique skins for each level, and bonus skins if he collects doubloons and jelly bits, but one of the sets are reserved as paid DLC, and wouldn't you know it, 
that set happens to have most of the meme references. Patrick is now a floating assist like the pod units in Nier Automata, or Chai's robot cat friend in Hi-Fi Rush. If you're down to one pair of briefs, Patrick can bring you an extra pair, but that's his only real purpose along with being someone who's always present so Spongebob doesn't talk to himself, and the game even acknowledges this. On the bright side, Clancy Brown voices Mr. Krabs this time, but the trade-off is that Spongebob sounds like he's from the later seasons, so it's a lateral movement in my opinion. SpongeBob. This flappin' robot crisis is making the Krusty Krab lose money like a sinking ship. No money means no more Krusty Krab. No more Krusty Krab means no more fry cooking for you. <laughs> no more fry cooking? So, of course you'll be compensated for all your thinking with this beautifully crafted treasure chest. Contents not included. Wow, the chest is the best part! Some of the set pieces are interesting in concept or execution. The Wild West level ends in a scrolling train set piece, not unlike Uncharted 2, and the Karate level has a set piece where you need to follow a scrolling camera and fight all the enemies, which causes the game to resemble a 2D beat-em-up. Keep in mind, this isn't a bad game by any means. If you want more Spongebob games, then Cosmic Shake is fine, but if you're hoping to get a game that's more of what Bikini Bottom offered, then you're getting a Monkey's Paw deal here. You got the same hub and the same worlds, but the overall experience is vastly different. I'd recommend the Cosmic Shake only if you're hurting for more Spongebob. Put that jelly in my belly! Finally, let's talk about a 30 minute meditation on life, death, and sand. Comes in Waves is a 2023 exploration game by Merlino Games. In my passing thoughts on A Plague Tale Innocence, I said a little blurb about what I thought about Merlino's previous release, The Chameleon. I felt bad after the fact, because I wrote it off as a game jam that needed more time in the oven, and I didn't want to write off waves like that. So what happens in It Comes in Waves? Something bad happened because of you. Something you can't apologize for. The town hates you for it, and there's nothing left to do but get in your cruiser and leave. You're carrying a specimen on your back, and you have to deliver it somewhere in a deep desert. There's an easy path you can cut through to reach the sanctuary, but you won't be able to enter until the specimen's fully grown. So, you'll have to search the desert for resources while the specimen gestates. Be careful about running into other people in the desert. You'll never know if they mean no harm, or just want you for your water. You need water to survive too, so you might consider keeping an eye on them, just in case your stock runs low. Along the way, you come across better or worse guns you can pick up to defend yourself. You can also find water tanks to replenish your reserves, infiltration upgrades that can reduce the rate at which you consume your water. You can also find materials that increase the amount of gestation in the specimen. There's no real guidance given to you, other than the mess of signs posted at the start of the desert area. I see the Demon Souls reference, Merlino. You can look at the map to figure out your position via landmarks. There's no way to set waypoints. You just have to get good at knowing what you're looking at versus what's marked in the map. Once a specimen's fully gestated, you can enter the sanctuary and the game ends. I follow the guy behind Merlino Games on Twitter, and he talked about the concept of an anti-game, a game made to critique a specific genre or style of play, and he likened Waves as an anti-game. I wasn't sure which genre It Comes in Waves was meant to critique, but I had two games in mind as I went through it. The low-poly aesthetic and sci-fi desert setting in Waves reminded me of the Tatooine levels in Knights of the Old Republic. It also reminded me of Sable, of all things. But where Sable was about a coming-of-age story full of warmth and safety, Waves is a game that's cold and desolate. Every person you come across in the desert is a potential threat you need to assess. Every step you take is another liter of water gone. Even though you can occasionally find pickups if you go off the beaten path, that's not always a guarantee, and you could end up wasting resources and dying of thirst as a result. Waves also reminded me of those strain of games that occasionally crop up on Steam that imitate Death Stranding. You play a character carrying something on their back and walk through a mostly empty wasteland. Man Standing and Walking Simulator 2020 come to mind. 
But where Death Stranding was an open world game that stripped away the facade that surrounded the core of what are essentially a set of fetch quests, these types of games don't really pick up where Death Stranding left off. They just become the derogatory version of what we like to call walking simulators. Go here, bring this with you, get an arbitrary set of meaningless points, rinse and repeat. Wait, scratch that. Walking Sim 2020 actually had something cooking without chugging four locos, grants you super speed. Coming back to Waves, its structure feels like a subversion of that type of aimless gameplay. You know where you have to go, and how to get there, but you can't go there yet because you're not ready. The specimen growth meter is effectively a game timer for how long you need to spend in the desert before the game says it's ready to end. While you're waiting, you might as well explore the world and pick up anything useful along the way. Sometimes, you come across camps and can read about what happened to all the people there. Sometimes the people are still there, and you end up being the reason it's a ghost town. Is there a point to all this? Maybe the point is there is no point. Life's a struggle. All we do once we come into this world is struggle, and that's all we know. That's how we interact with each other. We struggle to understand one another. We struggle to exist in spite of each other. We struggle to go on without each other. I wouldn't be surprised if Merlino deliberately designed the desert to have a circular layout, doubly so over the fact that the level flows so that we move clockwise around the map. We've got nothing but time, but once we realize that, it always feels like we're running out of it. In the title, it comes in waves. What are we referring to? The sand? Or grief? If you want to play a short game about loss, regret, and killing desert raiders on Tatooine, play it comes in waves. That's all the games I wanted to cover in this video. I might do this again next year. Thanks to all the new subscribers who joined after I made my Silent Hill 2 videos. I finally broke the 500 mark thanks to you guys. Stay tuned for more content, and thanks for watching.